Hi, I'm Max Tarjan. Um, I'm introducing Nicole because she worked on my team um, for a period, helped with one of our programs, and I also had the pleasure of serving on her master's thesis committee. So I'm really excited to have her presenting her work here. Uh, some background about Nicole, she completed her bachelor's in environmental biology at Cal Poly Pomona. Uh, while in school, she worked at a nature center and other parks in LA County. And she also volunteered at a wildlife rehab centers and the Aquarium of the Pacific. During that time, she assisted graduate students who were researching human impacts and shorebirds in marine protected areas. Uh, she enjoyed that research so much that she decided to go to graduate school at San Jose uh, State University. And we'll hear about the work that she did during her graduate program today. While she was doing her master's, she conducted wildlife surveys for Valley Water. Um, so that's in the South Bay. And she also was an intern with the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory within the Waterbird program. So as an intern, she helped create uh, volunteer training materials and also helped lead the in-person training for our Colonial Waterbird program, which is a program where we track nesting birds throughout the Bay Area with citizen scientists. Um, she also took the lead on coordinating volunteers during the 2017 season, and she surveyed her own colony in Sunnyvale. Uh, this week, she just started a position with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife in Newport Back Bay Preserve. So I'm assuming she is joining us from there. So a warm welcome to Nicole. Great to see you again. Excited to hear about your work. Thank you. <laughs> Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to my presentation about American kestrels. Um, I'll be discussing their habitat use um, in Santa Clara County. And this was my thesis topic at San Jose State. And so I'll just be going over part of my project. Um, first, I'll go over some basic information about kestrels and part of the literature review I did and then discuss more of my research project results. Um, I mainly wanted to research the topic of kestrel habitat because I read a lot of articles about their decline in numbers across the country. And I thought it was a really interesting um, topic. And there's not too much research in California uh, regarding habitat. A lot of that's on the East Coast. Um, so. I was mainly interested in looking at the potential development impacts to their breeding habitat and areas that we could try to conserve. Um, so the American kestrel appears to be declining in some areas due to habitat degradation and loss. A suitable habitat uh, typically includes open parkland, agricultural fields, hay fields, and meadows, and they nest in uh, cavities in oak trees. Uh, while Santa Clara County has suitable habitat, um, there's significant development in this area and it's unknown whether it really affected kestrel occupancy. Um, so some background information about them. Uh, the kestrel is a diurnal raptor and can be considered a resident of an area or a long distance migrant. In North America, kestrels that reside in northernly latitudes migrate to Central America or migrate to the southern U.S. Egg laying dates in California are between April 12th and May 3rd and typically lay four to five eggs in a clutch and have a 30-day incubation period. The nestling period is 28 days and fledging from the nest cavity can occur from the 25th day of hatching. There are also secondary cavity nesters that use holes in trees, um, such as the valley oak or coast live oak, and they can also use nest boxes if available. They typically forage on small mammals, birds, insects, and lizards, and their territory size can range from 0.5 kilometers to 1.8 kilometers. Um, here, American kestrels are considered least concern on the IUCN. However, a risk model was applied and <clears throat> from the breeding bird survey for kestrel numbers between 1970 and 2012, and they're found to be a continent-wide decline trend on across all 
bird conservation regions. Uh, this map shows a decline in different regions from 1966 to 2014. And to the right, the American Kestrel Partnership map um, shows areas in red where they're declining. In yellow, the trend is uncertain. And in green, there's an increase. Um, the American Kestrel Partnership is developing and coordinating a nest box program uh, to generate kestrel nesting data and environmental factors that can impact them. And on their website, there's a lot of information on how to make your own nest box and um, collect feather samples to send to them too. There's a lot of different hypotheses of their decline. Um, some have been disproven or need more investigation. Um, <clears throat> One researcher investigated West Nile virus and found that the declines happened before the West Nile virus arrived. Cooper's hawks also prey on kestrels, um, but there's no significant correlations found um, between the decline and increase the decline in kestrels and increase in Cooper's hawk population. Um, they also evaluated nest box habitat quality on the East Coast in Canada and found results suggesting that habitat surrounding nest boxes may not be as suitable. Um, some authors suggest that pr the principal cause of declines in the eastern U.S. could be the losses of birds on wintering grounds or along migration routes. Insecticides have been discussed um, due to the kestrel's diet and habitat in agricultural fields, but not further studied in the field. And finally, the loss of habitat and nesting sites have been hypothesized to have impacts, um, but more studies are needed in a lot of other areas. And now I'll talk about land use. Um, kestrels may be adapted to uh, be found in different land uses, including urban land use. Kestrels were found in Colorado to not be sensitive up to 30% urbanization in developed areas. Kestrels studied in Baja, California were positively influenced by urban areas that still holds natural habitat um, and due to the potential food and nesting structures. And although they may use urban land use, disturbance um, from that can have negative repercussions. Um, female kestrels in higher disturbance areas had higher cortisol levels and were more likely to abandon nests than females in lower disturbance areas. And proximity to busy roads and developed areas promoted nest abandonment. Um, kestrels typically prefer a variety of land cover. Um, with short grass and pasture habitat and higher prey quality. Um, migrant kestrels in Florida used hunting substrate of weedy forbs less than 25 centimeters in height. In Utah, they were found to be in irrigated pastures, uh, dry cropland and rural residential habitats. Uh, kestrels in Quebec were attracted to meadows, pastures, um, destined for farming in the early spring. And in Idaho, kestrels preferred land cover and irrigated crop because that area had higher prey quality compared to non-irrigated uh, shrub grasslands. Um, the nest site selection and availability can also affect the fitness and habitat selection of kestrels. Um, nest boxes may be beneficial when natural cavities are limited and may allow researchers to monitor some of the reproduction, um, reproductive success and breeding ecology of American kestrels. Um, while they are beneficial, they can be detrimental to populations if they're placed in low quality habitat and if they're not maintained or monitored. So it's important to monitor and um, make sure that they're in better quality habitat. Um, so in California, the land use has dramatically changed um, from urban or from 
agricultural to urban development since the 1980s in Santa Clara County. The kestrel is a common resident, doesn't migrate typically uh, where there's suitable grasslands. Um, the breeding bird atlas states that there's been a long-term decline about 1.6 to 3.3 cent per year in the county and also on the Christmas bird counts. Uh, San Francisco Bay has become more urbanized, um, more people that causes loss of habitat and um, wildlife in Monterey County kestrel declines could be possibly due to loss of oak woodland and riparian forest. In Marin County, um, the kestrel's an uncommon breeder. And in Santa Clara County, it does, it's not known if urban areas are causing this decline. Other common raptors like the white-tailed kite and the red-tailed red hawk are not declining. Um, so although they're found in different land uses, the habitat qualities haven't been assessed. So that's what I did with my study, um, just analyzing different features of habitat um, that are occupied by kestrels and not occupied by them to compare them. So you don't have to read all of this, but <laughs> um, these are just some of my research questions and hypotheses. And, um, overall, essentially what I was looking for um, was to just assess different habitat features, land cover, land use between where kestrels were found compared to where they were not seen. And then also comparing the occupied sites with some of the nest box sites, um, the locations of them. Um, so this is a map of the location. Um, so all the sites are in yellow and blue. Um, the occupied sites are in blue and then the unoccupied are in yellow and everything's within Santa Clara County boundary. Um, so this region is a Mediterranean climate. Um, historically perennial grasses dominated interior and coastal grasslands but some of the invasive annual grasses are now dominant. Um, supported by some human disturbance such as overgrazing, agriculture, and brush clearing. Um, population growth and land use change intensified in the 1980s um, where orchards, agriculture, open grasslands were lost to urbanization and commercial land use. Um, so my, for my study, I used 2016 and 2017 eBird sites to get an idea of where they could be present. Um, and I used that from March to August. And to compare those present sites, I chose uh, random locations uh, where kestrels were not documented. Um, for that, I used ArcMap, a random point creator within the same general plan land uses. Um, as the present sites. And I did point counts and that began May 27th and continued until August 7th. Um, so in the field, I visited one to three kestrel locations a week and each site was visited twice. A site would be considered occupied if I saw kestrel behaviors, which included territorial behavior, hovering and foraging and perching. Um, I stayed at each site for about 30 minutes and recorded different variables like weather, percent vegetation um, within 250 meters, uh, land use, if the habitat was grazed, any roads nearby, um, any human disturbance and nest box visibility. Um, <clears throat> I just used my binoculars, the Nikon binoculars and a spotter scope. Um, any bird of prey or adult um, and juvenile kestrel seen within uh, my buffer was recorded. And survey points were at least 700 meters apart uh, due to their territory size. And I calculated the percent land cover in each buffer.
And <clears throat> so these are the different types of land use that I recorded um, for each site uh, in three categories, developed, open space, or agricultural. Um, developed is low to high intensity development. Agriculture was cultivated crops, hay, and pasture. And then open space was within like wetlands, open water, shrub scrub, uh, and grassland. And this is just one example of what the land cover looks like it, um, in a buffer. Uh, the point represents the site where kestrels were seen and the habitat types that are recorded on this um, in the GIS uh, was developed grassland, shrub scrub, uh, wetland, uh, forest, mixed evergreen forest, pasture hay, cultivated crops. Um, for the analysis, I had to combine some of these land covers um, to be able to do the analysis. Um, so I didn't have a high sample size. Um, so a few of them were combined based on like habitat similarity. And the distance to the nearest road was calculated using an arc map tool, um, the measure tool, which included um, avenues, roads, boulevards, and lanes. And I also added in SBOX information, uh, the locations, um, just to compare to occupied Kestrel sites to see maybe where we could put some more nest boxes. Um, so Lee Pauser is the one who built all of these and he's a volunteer of the Audubon Society and he's really nice and let me come to the sites and check them out and um, use this information and he installed them at Santa Teresa County Park, IBM, uh, Guadalupe Oak Grove and Cinnabar Hills. Um, so a total of 57 sites were visited. I had to exclude a couple um, due to not being able to get to them. Um, 22 sites, kestrels were present, and 35 where they were absent. Um, there were 47 kestrels seen in both surveys total. And for birds of prey, combining all the sites, there's 206 birds of prey. And this is just some of the other birds that I saw in the fields. So we had turkey vulture, red-tailed hawk, red-shouldered hawk, white-tailed kite, and then a few unknowns, which I assume were acceptors. I just couldn't fully tell what they were. Um, so here's a graph of showing the mean of raptors in each land use type. Um, raptor numbers, except for turkey vultures, were added together. Um, a man Whitney U test was used to um, look at the difference between raptors in occupied kestrel sites and unoccupied and showed that there are no difference. Um, there were, however, significantly more raptors at developed land use sites than at the other land use sites that I saw. Um, so the highest, I just want to show like the highest kestrel activity areas. Um, including adults and juvenile kestrels. Um, the highest scene was in one survey was four of them, uh, which was at an open space land use site at Bernal Historic Park. In both surveys combined, the highest number I saw was five at Laguna Avenue. Um, so this is an example of the site at Laguna, um, just what the land cover looks like. Um, so it's mainly cultivated crops and then developed open space. And then um, with all the variables that I used, um, I had to do a Pearson's correlation, which kind of eliminated a few of them. So I was left with just a couple um, to do the analysis. So I used a log logistic regression model um, to determine the effects of the variables on the likelihood that kestrels would be at a site. Um, so grassland and pasture hay added significantly to the model prediction, but forest and distance to road did not.
um, a Mann Whitney U test could, um, between these variables, that grassland shrub scrub was a significant predictor out of all of the variables. And um, overall, it seemed like the grassland shrub scrub was the most explanatory of all of them for the presence of the kestrels. Um, then I looked at uh, the grassland percentage in each type of land use, and there is no um, difference between the three land uses with respect to the grassland, but um, here you can see that open space was a little bit higher than the others. And then I just did the mean of the percentages of each one. Um, so the mean percentage of developed forest and open water wetland habitat types were dominant at sites not occupied by kestrels, um, while grassland, shrub scrub, and pasture hay crops were the two most common habitat types at sites occupied by kestrels. Um, the mean distance to the nearest road and occupied sites was greater than the mean distance to road and unoccupied sites. And then I just compared the nest box site locations, um, the percent habitat around those, um, comparing them to the places where I saw kestrels. Um, so um, it was similar in developed forest and open water wetlands. At nest box sites, there were a greater average percent cover of grasslands and a lower level of pasture hay crops um, compared to the occupied sites. The mean distance to road was greater in the nest box sites compared to the occupied sites. Um, so overall, like the key goal of the study was to determine the significant habitat occupied by kestrels um, during the breeding season and if developed areas and um, variables had any significant effect to the occupancy. Um, so my results showed that grassland shrub and pasture hay were significant predictors and the developed habitat type was not significant. Um, we also found that the abundance of raptors was much greater at developed sites than in agricultural and open space. Um, the density of raptors could be partially maybe due to the availability of prey in urban areas. And kestrels had a few interactions with red-tailed hawks that I saw at some of the sites. Um, they had some defensive territorial behavior with them and um, there's some literature about <clears throat> both of them sharing similar habitat and also the, the perch type um, and also the prey that they eat. So um, they could be having some competition. Um, so the habitat qualities preferred by kestrels can help guide kestrel nest box programs. Um, grassland was the most dominant habitat type around the nest boxes used by kestrels. Um, the pasture hay crop was lower, so it might be beneficial to add more nest boxes to that agricultural areas and in the future. Um, so in conclusion, uh, this research didn't show much significance of development to kestrels, um, so I couldn't really determine if that was one of the causes of the decline um, in this county, but it does confirm the importance of <clears throat> grassland habitat, especially in open space land uses. And I think adding more nest boxes, um, like what Lee was doing, into more grassland and agricultural areas in open space could possibly attract more for future studies. Um, I wish I was able to look at the reproductive success and prey type, but a future study could, you know, monitor the reproduction and prey type and associate those with the land cover and land use so you can get more of an idea of um, their habitat selection and you know why they choose certain sites over the other or which one's more beneficial for them. Yeah and that's 
that's basically it. <laughs> um, so if you guys have any questions, um, yeah, let me know. And then this is everyone who helped me. Um, Lynn Trulio, Dr. Rachel O'Malley, Max, uh, Richard, Lee, and just my family and friends. All right, thank you, Nicole. So um, in the very beginning of your slides, you had a picture of an American kestrel. And Maureen asked if that first picture is a female and if the, the one on the next slide with the blue gray wings is the male. Um, let me see, the, is it the picture of me holding one or? I think it's what you had in your presentation. Okay, let me. Or you can describe differences between males and females, perhaps. Okay, um, so the females, um, they just have like reddish brown on the back. Um, they don't have those blue markings. So the female looks a lot plainer. Um, the males do have the, the blue markings on them. Um, so yeah, that's one of the differences. In my part. Yeah, so it looks like you were right there, <laughs> Maureen, probably. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so Hecker fam asked, does global warming affect these amazing kestrels? Um, it's possible. Like, there are some studies that talk about climate change. Um, so that has a little bit to do with, like, the migration patterns. Um, so with the changing of that, like, there have been studies where um, they might start nesting a little earlier based on the prey availability. So if like the weather is changing, um, there might be prey available at different times. So that was studied. Um, so there has been kind of a shift in like when they start foraging and nesting um, because of possible like weather change or climate change. So it, it could be possible. And um, yeah, some could migrate earlier based on that too. So um, that could be affecting like where they're present at certain times. Yeah. Um, Cecilia <laughs> says, I always thought of turkey vultures as eating only carrion. So why would they be a predator for kestrels? Um, so the turkey vultures, I just recorded um, just to note that they were there. Um, I didn't use them in the analysis. I only used the other raptors that I saw because, yeah, turkey vultures wouldn't really um, make too much of a difference. <laughs> so, yeah, you're right. Um, but, yeah, so I didn't include them in the analysis for that reason. Um, Hecker fam asked if more studies are mandatory. Um, yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, so I think like based on some of the recent research, like there's a lot of people out there that, you know, have been researching kestrels for years and still can't figure out why they're declining. Um, and even though they're not threatened or endangered right now, it's still important to get that information before something like that happens. So I think it's important to, you know, continue doing these studies, getting more information, um, possibly before that happens, you know. Um, so yeah, I think it's still important. <laughs> yeah, it's important to keep common birds common. Yeah. <laughs> um, Laura asked, why would kestrels be more prevalent in urban environments compared to more natural ones? Um, it could just be possible, like the prey availability. Um, uh, typically, like urban land use, um, people attract different rodents <laughs> in the area that they're scavenging for food. Um, so it's possible that. Um, small mammals might be more prevalent and kestrels eat those and that could be why they might be found in urban areas also. Um, yeah. Iwe asked if your thesis is published and available to read? 
Um, so I published it at school. Um, so it should be on the San Jose State website uh, under graduate students in environmental studies. Um, it should be public and available now. Great. Judy asked, would the material of the nest box, like the type of wood it's made out of, be a factor in kestrels occupying them? Um, that's a good question. I haven't read any studies that really talked about that yet. I know there has been some that did compare, but I haven't, I'm not sure if they published anything yet. Um, there was one person like trying to use different types of wood. Um, so it could possibly make an impact. I'm not sure what that result was. Um, but yeah, it would be interesting to see if there's some type of difference. And I know the the sun hitting the nest boxes can also make a difference in the temperature. So the color of the box would make a difference. Um, yeah, regarding like temperature effects and stuff like that. But yeah, I know there's some research about it, but <laughs> I haven't seen the results. Um, Steve asked, where can I get nest box requirements, hole size, cavity size, etc.? Um, so the American Kestrel Partnership, um, their website should provide that information. Um, I know they have like a guide that you can save, like a PDF um, of all the dimensions and everything. It should be on their website um, if you check that. So yeah, they definitely want like more information and people to participate in that too. Um, Kendra asked, did any of your findings particularly surprise you? Um, I think the fact that development didn't have a significant difference. <laughs> um, I thought there would be uh, something about that, but I did have a low sample size. Um, so that could make a difference too. Um, but yeah, I think that mainly was surprising to me that it, it wasn't significant compared to the other ones. Rachel asked, have you observed any nest cavity competition with European starlings? Um, so in my project, I was only able to see, like positively identify um, a nest cavity in Valley Oak. Um, I didn't see any competition with the starlings with that one, um, but I have gone to UC Merced um, just to volunteer with Steve Simmons, and he has a whole nest box program there on their reserve. And there was, uh, when we went around uh, banding them, there was some starlings there, like trying to take over <laughs> their nest boxes. So. Um, yeah, that's definitely an issue. Okay, Dudley says your map early on showed an increase in kestrel populations only along the Mississippi and the Rio Grande. Any idea why? Um, that I'm not too sure. <laughs> um, I haven't seen too many published articles about it. Um, but that's a good question and something to look into, like um, why those very distinct spots would be increasing. Um, but yeah, I haven't um, seen a published article about it yet, um, but that's something to look into. Um, Jan, says we see kestrels hunting in air like hovering but also mm -hmm. kestrels spend a lot of time on perches phone lines posts etc mm -hmm. could availability of perches have anything to do with kestrel success um yeah that's a good question um so i for my research i recorded um the types of perches that they were using and that's something that i had in mind too like i was thinking about like how i could possibly analyze that part, um, but it was a little too difficult to count all of the perches in that area because um, there's 
a lot of things that could be counted as fridges, but um, yeah, that could definitely make a difference in success. Um, if there's, you know, very limited purchase, it could possibly create competition or um, with other birds or within themselves. And um, so that's definitely important to have perch availability um, for kestrels and um, enough space in between them too. <laughs> Karen asked if you could describe their flight and general behavior from your observations during your study in a nutshell, if possible. Um, so there's a few that I, I just saw perched like most of the time that I was watching them. <laughs> but um, there's a couple that were hunting and foraging. Um, and it was really cool to see like they, they kind of just <laughs> hover in the air um, in flight. And then they dive down really fast um, and then grab, you know, a small mammal or something on the ground. Um, so it's a really fast process. Like they're hovering for a little while, like a few minutes, and then like immediately go down and strike the prey and um, come back up to a perch. But it was really fun to watch. <laughs> um, that's mostly what I got to see with their hunting behavior and there's a little bit of competition with other birds too. Um, they have a very distinct clee clee call <laughs> and um, you know it makes it really easy to find them too which was nice. Um, so I heard them from a far distance and I saw them kind of harassing the red-tailed hawks in the area. <laughs> Um, which was really interesting. Um, so that's just a couple behaviors I saw. Cool. I think we'll have to look up some videos of kestrels now. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Hecker fam asked, do kestrels like temperate places or cooler places? Um, I mean, they're they're pretty much found everywhere. <laughs> um, they're very like much a generalist species so um, they're found in like Canada, the U.S. and <clears throat> down in Mexico and Central America so they're kind of found all over the place um, so they could be found in both areas and um, you know they just some of them do migrate from north to south and yeah, during certain times, but yeah. <laughs> uh, California bluebirder um, mm -hmm. is referring to raptors in developed areas. Um, did you look at parks or residential areas? Um, how many developed areas did you check? Um, <clears throat> for developed, I it's kind of a range. Um, so I checked residential areas um, that still had a little bit of like open space adjacent. Um, so it wasn't like in the city or anything. It was kind of on the outer edges of the urban area. Um, so, and then also like commercial development too. Um, so yeah, it was within like the urban fringe, I guess. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's mainly where I looked for the developed sites. Um, the number of developed sites, um, I would have to check back on my, <laughs> um, my paper. <laughs> um, I don't remember exactly how many sites. I tried to go as evenly as possible to each type of land use, um, and try to make it even as much as I could. <laughs> Jan asked, do we have both migrating and resident populations of kestrels? Um, in Santa Clara County, um, it's just known that residents are, kestrels are resident in this area. Um, on the, in the other counties, um, there can be migratory kestrels. So 
um, just from what I read and what I researched, like Santa Clara County just has residents um, that we know of anyway. Jan also asked, um, has anyone done any local detailed studies of prey, for example, the mix of insects versus mammals versus lizards? Um, I haven't seen any local ones. Um, that's definitely a good project idea. <laughs> um, yeah, I haven't read any about that in this area. Um, I think there are some in other counties maybe, but um, there might've been one in Merced actually, um, looking at prey type um, and doing like a more genetic analysis of it. Um, but I don't know any in Santa Clara. So that's a good idea of something to do in the future. <laughs> Um, Chris, uh, Chris asked for previous Christmas bird count, breeding bird survey, or eBird records. Is anyone looking at habitat change or other factors to explain why they're no longer there? Um, like the, I guess, habitat change over time. Um, I haven't seen any, and that's something that I kind of wanted to do at first. Um, I just didn't do that part. <laughs> but um, yeah, I kind of wanted to look at like the land use change over time and then compare that to maybe kestrel numbers. So that's another idea. I haven't seen anyone do that yet, um, but it's another idea for a project in the future. <laughs> um, Jose says, thank you for the informative presentation. I have read about falcons being closely related to parrots than they are to hawks and eagles. Is this now the consensus? Um, in addition, is there any research being conducted on behavioral differences and differences between falcons and parrots? I bet you had an incredible experience being out in the field. Um, what is your most memorable, memorable experience working with kestrels? So there's a lot of questions there, so let me know if you need any repeats. Okay. <laughs> um. I'm actually not too sure. I can't say 100% that they're more closely related. I would have to look that up. Um, um, that's possible. <laughs> and um, the second question, uh, oh, studying the behavioral differences. Um, that will be interesting. Um, I haven't worked with parrots before, so I'm not too sure what you know similarities or differences there would be but um that would be really interesting to look at and then uh the last part of this question was what was your most memorable experience working with kestrels oh, okay um let's see <laughs> i feel like all of it was <laughs> um i really liked um observing them from afar, um, just watching their behavior the whole time was really fun. I also really appreciated going to um, UC Merced and banding them, like seeing them up close and holding them and looking at their chicks, <laughs> that was really fun. Um, and then with Lee, I really liked watching them coming and going from their nest boxes and um, just watching their behavior around there too. So I feel like all of it was pretty memorable. <laughs> Sean Lockwood says, congrats on your new job with California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And thanks for all the work you did for us at Valley Water. Um, oh. <laughs> what is your new position? Um, so my new position is at the Newport Back Bay, um, just as like a scientific assistant and um, so we're just doing like vegetation management, some maintenance, um, we're looking at um, the California least turn colonies in that area and doing surveys on them and um, I just started this week so there's gonna be more <laughs> later but that's what we're starting with so pretty fun. <laughs> Uh, Dan asked, is anyone still monitoring the nest boxes? 
Um, so I'm not sure if Lee is this year. I need to uh, talk to him. Um, but he's in charge of all of those at the ones that I looked at. I know there that he was trying to start one in Gilroy um, with some of the students there. So that might, I'm not sure what's happening right now because of everything going on, but um, they're, they're still out there. And I would have to just contact Lee to ask if he's still monitoring this breeding season. I'm not too sure. Um, Chris asked if kestrels are being recorded, like through the CBC, BBS, eBird, um, if they're recorded in a site but no longer present, are you or anyone else looking to see if habitat or something else changed? So I think this is related to that previous question that Chris asked, but... Um, um, right now, I... Um, I haven't been monitoring that. Um, I have information if ever if anyone wants to. <laughs> um, since I just moved about like a month ago, I moved back to my hometown area, so I'm not up there anymore. But um, yeah, if anyone's interested, I can try to help, like give some info on where they are. But um, yeah, not that I know of. I don't know if anyone's looking at that right now or like monitoring any changes going on. Hecker Pham asked, what are some things I can do to help? Um, so I think looking into the American Kestrel Partnership website um, and just looking at some of the research that they're doing and stuff that they're trying to monitor. I know they're trying to collect like feathers um, to do more analysis of them. Um, <clears throat> looking at that website, possibly um, contacting um, Lee, which I could try to see what's going on with his Nest Fox program <laughs> um, with Audubon. Um, so you could contact me if you want, um, and then maybe try to volunteer doing that stuff like monitoring or um, helping build some nest boxes too. Um, that would be really good. Um, yeah, maybe just using eBird is really helpful. That's what helped me find all of the kestrels was using eBird. So that's really good citizen science, um, participating in that, like going birding for fun, going hiking, um, recording if you see any. Um, through eBird, that's uh, very useful. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I guess um, as a follow-up to that, um, they said that they have a kestrel in their yard, a, a female kestrel, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And so they wanted to know what are some things they can do to help that specific kestrel too. Okay. Um, I mean, I guess if if they're nesting, you know, just let them be, try to not like disturb them or anything. Um, if they're maybe already nesting, then there could be a cavity around the area, like in one of your trees or something. So just maintaining a distance, but maybe like try to monitor them with binoculars. Um, could like record their behavior, um, other variables that you see. Um, yeah, I think just like monitoring them and making sure they're okay in that area and um yeah <laughs> um annette wants to know which wildlife we have you worked or volunteered for um so one of them was the um, international bird rescue center um that was in san pedro and that's mainly like water birds, so shorebirds, waterfowl, um, pelagic birds, and um, <clears throat> that was the rehab. And then when I worked at a nature center, it was partially a rehab also um, with wild wings in Southern California. Um, <clears throat> so we also rehabbed like smaller birds and hawks and 
um, release them after um, giving them treatment or um, food and housing and stuff. <laughs> Um, Prakash asked, how far do they go from the nest typically when they're looking for prey? Um, so their territory size, it can range um, from 0.5 kilometers to about like two kilometers. Um, so that's typically the range that you would probably see them foraging at. Um, so it's, it's a big range. <laughs> Okay, I think that was our last question. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll add that Maureen mentioned that for the parrot connection, look at their bills. So I think that's <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if anybody else thinks of any questions for Nicole, feel free to email me those and I'm happy to send those to her and share the answers mm -hmm. with everybody. Um, thank you again, Nicole, for giving this talk. It was really great to learn about your work and about kestrels because we don't really uh, do a lot of work with raptors ourselves so it's always great to to hear about them. Um, uh, Nicole is there anything else you want to add? Um, I guess that's it. <laughs> yeah I just want to thank everyone for coming and listening and I really appreciate it and yeah just continue birding. <laughs> um, and ask, feel free to ask me anything. You can email me um, if you're interested in doing some type of project with this information, but yeah. <laughs>